The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 692 for Monday, January 15th, 2018. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where you send in your questions, tips, and cool stuff found. We share it all. We share our own cool stuff found, questions, and tips, with the goal being that every single one of us here, me included, learns at least, yes, five new things each and every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit from Barebones Software at barebones.com. We'll talk about that shortly. And a new sponsor... RoboForm, the password manager. We're at RoboForm.com. You can save 10 bucks off your RoboForm Everywhere subscription with the coupon code MGG. We'll talk more about that later, too. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here, a bit out of the weather, no doubt suffering from post-CES cruft. In Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Hey, John F. Braun. You got to get the cruft out, man. They, like, I'm that's, trying. That's what we got. I'm trying. Like, I, I will try to not Onyx? do it on mic. Can you run Onyx on your uh, on your body to clean the cruft out? <laughs> if they had a, a version that would work on on bioforms instead of computers, maybe. I think that would be a good thing, man. But we got to get to work on that. Isn't that what they used on Star Trek for? Uh, Who is that yeah. over there? Oh, and here, here, oh. in another part of Durham, New Hampshire. This pilot, Pete. Thanks for having me back, Dave. Thanks for coming. I'm glad yeah. it all worked. Yeah, yeah it's minute, good to have you, man. Rushing over here, but I made it. Cool. So, hey, quick question before you start. Sh- quick sh- question. I think we've already started. Yeah. yeah well, it's you fine. Said, well, you know what I mean. It's the the agenda. You said we had to learn five new things. Problem is, I have to forget five things to put the five new things in. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now let's, let's get going. I'm sorry. I'll good. You need more RAM. Okay. You got to exactly. upgrade your your RAM there, Pete. Boy, ain't that the truth? Wet wetware, right? We call that fixing that's our wetware. That's it. Yeah. Got to ram more in there. There you go. <laughs> uh, let's go to Jeff. Let's let's make sure we get what we need to get out of this show. What does Jeff want to know? Jeff asks, he says, I recently installed uh, Mac OS on my Mac Pro. Uh, all is working fine, but I seem to have lost the option in messages on my Mac to send an SMS text message when the recipient doesn't have iMessage available. This used to work fine and does work fine on my MacBook. I guess it's an iCloud thing. On my iPhone 7, I have gone into settings, messages, text message forwarding, and I have Jeff's MacBook, Mac, sorry, Jeff's Mac Pro in there, not once, but twice. Both are checked to allow the devices to send SMS via this phone. I flipped them on and off, but I can't seem to find where I can maybe remove them so I can reset it. Can you please investigate as I've tried and tried and cannot find a solution? So um, the only thing or at least the first thing that I would check is on your Mac, go into the messages app, go into preferences, go into accounts and choose your iMessage account. You may have more than one account in there if you've got like Google Talk or whatever, Uh, not AIM because that's gone now Uh, on that screen with your iMessage account. Make sure that your phone number is checked as a device where, or as a, a an address where you can receive and then also send things. That, I think, makes a difference here because if you don't have your phone number kind of activated on your Mac, then you can't do SMS. So I, I think that's that, well, it's certainly the first thing I would try. Uh, John, you got any thoughts on this? Where's that again? Messages. Right. Preferences. Oh, in the messages app. In the messages app. Yep. Preferences. And then accounts. And then your iMessage account. And there's a thing that says you can be reached for messages at. And you've got all these things there. One of them is going to be your phone number. That has to be checked in order for those things to work in my experience. Okay. I know it's a little buried. Now, to be fair, you don't have to at the below that you have an option for sending red receipts. I'm not, I'm on Sierra, not High Sierra, on the podcasting machine still. So I, this might be a little different, but I saw it earlier. It's not that different. Well, it's the same. Okay. Yeah. And then at the bottom, you have the option start new conversations from, and you can pick anything you want here. Having the phone number selected here is not mandatory for the um, 
for the SMS thing. It will automatically do that. I highly recommend not starting new conversations from your phone number only because, really? well, if your phone number changes, i.e. if you travel to okay. a foreign country and use a SIM card that has by, by its nature, a different phone number, no one that has your phone number for iMessage will be able to reach you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, that, that freaks my wife out. She can't figure out why sometimes yeah, it's my get... email address and other times it's my phone number. Yep. But I actually have another suggestion here. At the so, uh, uh, okay. I, I'll come to it. Okay. I just want to just to complete that thought. Starting new conversations, pick an address and homogenize all your devices to that. You've got to go into the settings for each device and say start new conversations from uh, and then just choose the same thing so that. At least there's some consistency when you're sending yeah. messages to people. So go ahead, Pete. And then, well, and then it's on the iOS device as well. It's yep. under settings, uh, messages, and then text message forwarding. And you have to uh, select your, your Mac. Your, your Mac, yeah. And I don't know what to do if your Mac isn't there. Well, his Mac is there twice oh, and oh, selected. Oh, that's right. He did say that. Yeah. He mentioned that. So, yeah. okay. Um, I'll unselect one and try. Uh, that's true. He said he has. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's this setting on your on your. On My your brain Mac. will be here in a minute, Dave. Hey, it's fine. <laughs> it's okay. I literally I walked in uh, ninety seconds before we kicked yeah, off. Yeah, it's true. Show. Yeah, it's so true. I'll, I'll, it'll be right behind me, I'm sure. Yeah. If it doesn't get lost. <laughs> <sighs> Yes. So at least on both of my Macs, it's set to my uh, cell phone number, not my email address. So. Yeah. By default, that's what it's going to start. That's what it's going to oh, okay. be set to. But I just, I, I found a couple of years ago when we traveled and needed new SIM cards, it was like, oh, this sucks. Everybody that I iMessage with does it with my phone number. And there's no reason to have things tied to a phone number because I don't yeah. own that number. I mean, I might, that number may change. Now I have three selected though. I have my phone number and both of my iCloud email addresses. So I, yeah, what we're talking about is the start new conversations from box, which is at mm. the bottom of that preference window. Mm. Send and receive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, looky there at that. See that? Yeah, that one. Yeah. You get to pick. Now, if somebody <clears throat> texts you or iMessages you at your phone number, it doesn't matter what this start new conversations from right. thing is. It's going to reply to. From that. Phone. Yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Okay. Exactly. So. Well, cool. Well, now this, you may have mentioned this, but I was fiddling with my device here, which of course. Know, we, we all do these days. But on my iPhone, when others. it went to settings, messages, there's an option send as SMS and it's off. And really? it says send an SMS when iMessage is unavailable. Carrier messaging rates may may apply, which at least for my current plan, I have unlimited right. voice and text and all that stuff here. But it's funny that it's off. Yeah, I wonder why you have that off. Because by default, I believe that's uh, maybe that's Ooh. no, that might be off by default. Yeah. Yeah, and it's buried in there. It's in the yeah settings. Yeah. So messages. you still have a plan that requires text. Uh, yeah. Pay, pay by text. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I think it just it sounds like off. it's a backup here. So yeah. for, my, for for the people I that I know on. that don't have, well, I'm going to turn it on right now, and yeah. hopefully the world it, won't come. You'll to an still, end. even with that off, you'll still send SMS to people that that don't have iMessage. What that's for is if the phone can't get a data connection to send an iMessage out, it will. If the person has a phone number attached to their contact record, or if you're sending to a phone number, it will send. Right, right. right. It won't use data. It'll right. use the, the phone line side of the house. And if it can't, and then yeah. I think what you mentioned is that the entry below that is send and receive, and it has three addresses, and it looks like my cell phone number is the the default. Start new conversation. Okay, so that's the equivalent on on the iOS device. Exactly. All right, so all of mine are set to my cell phone number, which has been the same for decades. So sure, I see no reason to change it. But I understand your concern. Yeah. You know, yeah, if you yeah. pop around and change your cell phone number all the time, then you yeah. If you if you put a new SIM card in, your phone number will change, right? Mm -hmm. So if you go to a different country and you're not using your U.S. Right. data plan there, it's sort of by definition, you're going to have a different number. So yeah. All right, good, oh, that's, fun. That's the beauty of the new data plan, at least with AT and T overseas. It's yeah. it's cheaper than. Oh yeah, than it is now. Card. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, moving to uh, staying on the same subject, we'll, we'll go to Zach. Zach, he has kind of a rant, but I, I, I think it's an interesting conversation. He said, I would like to start a movement to upgrade standards of cell phone texting to include better group texting standards 
including A, some sort of BCC, and B, a warning when you were replying to a group text you didn't notice was a group text. Hey, man, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe starting with the developers of Apple Messages would be the way to go. Let me know your thoughts. So, I, yes, I, well, Dave, I echo Pete's sentiments, <laughs> right? Go ahead, John. But I, I, well, I agree, I got, I, but I got an asterisk there. Go ahead. Well, all I'm going to say is that at our recent trip to CES, you had created, thank you, um, a group uh, which we jokingly, or not so jokingly, called, a, I, I think it was Mac Cool Kids. I just called it Mac Kids. I, t- I left cool out of it. The Mac Kids. Yeah. But we know we're cool. Okay. Well, uh, or we it goes without cool. saying. But, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that worked out splendidly because it, it did exactly. It, it was a uh, uh, people in our circle who we knew had uh, texting abilities, and you just created a group, and then it, it was a broadcast, and and now it's done. Right. Right. So I, yeah, I, I, but. To Zach's point, that doesn't solve any of the problems that he's talking about here, oh, right? right? Because, well, because iMessage doesn't really have any advanced features, right? iMessage is... Well, you made a group, but that's part of the standard then. You just created a group of numbers that you had on hand, and then that group persisted. Yes, but it... it right, so it, it's important to remember that iMessage is sort of almost an analog to SMS with some... Enhance some what I'll call compatible enhancements, user interface wise compatible, not necessarily compatible with SMS. And that is they've added for non groups red receipts. You don't get that with SMS, but you don't have to change the UI to do red receipts for iMessage and and not for SMS. Right. So messages has to be kind of live within this box of the UI needs to work for both SMS and whatever enhancements they make to iMessage. And one cool enhancement to iMessage is that you can create a group as you can with SMS, and then you can name the group and everyone in the group sees the new name, which is handy because that will help with these kinds of things. When you're replying to a group, you'll see the name of the group at the top of your thing and be like, oh, yeah, right. OK, but even still, like I, I texted the group the other day and uh, but we have a family group, too, uh, and my wife replied uh, and it wasn't anything awful or anything, but she replied something that she probably didn't in- intend to send to the kids. It, you know, it, it, they're it, sucking the life out of me. No, no. Yeah, right. No, it was just it was actually a comment about one of the kids. It was, oh, yeah. a, it was she was watching a, a, one of the Lucas's hockey games and she was very honest about her comments about how the team was playing. I was like, huh. OK, well, I mean, we're pretty honest in our house. Maybe she did intend to send it. To, but, it, you know, like that kind of thing can happen um, better than than SMS is are platforms that are completely independent of SMS. And I don't consider iMessage independent, but something like Facebook Messenger, it definitely is. Snapchat, Kick, Slack, right? Those are all... Yeah, WhatsApp is the one we use at work. Oh, okay, yeah, because that's that, right. Yeah, that meets it perfectly. You can add and yep. take... And the other nice thing about that, and I, I don't remember all the way back to the question, sure, but the the ability to come out... You know, like an iMessage, if you're in a group iMessage, you just have to wind up blocking Correct. everybody, which yes. is not ideal. You know, my, yeah, my you daughter winds leave. up. Yeah. Right. And it's like, hey, quit, you know, quit sending me this stuff. I'm in class. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. So. WhatsApp is great. Yeah, I, it I, is. Yeah. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Um, Pete, you can check out any time, but you can never leave. There you trade. go. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's exactly. iMessage is Hotel California for yeah, sure. Oh, man. Um, But like Facebook Messenger, I feel like that one and WhatsApp and WhatsApp is also owned by Facebook. Now it's owned by Facebook. Yeah, Yeah. it was independent. Facebook, it was bought it. They haven't figured out how to monetize it yet, I guess. But yeah, um, I I love WhatsApp. The the sound quality on it's good. The ability to have group chats. and So, So that to me, that's really where this is going is just completely leaving SMS behind. And going with with these one of these other messaging platforms because Facebook or WhatsApp or any of these certainly could put all these features in. Uh, and I really like Facebook's ability to like I can I was part of a couple of uh, CES uh, like like different cool kids groups, John, for lack of a better term, like, you know, the CES party group and the CES this group. 
And those oh, messages, geez. you probably noticed it at dinner. I would mute them for 24 hours because it was just like an insane amount of traffic on this. And I could go and check it when I wanted, but I wasn't getting notifications. And for whatever reason, it was like 7 p.m. when I muted it the first time. So I'd be in the middle of dinner and suddenly it would be like I have to take my watch and throw it across the room because I can't function anymore. Um, and yeah, I would just well, you go and mute give it. Give me the top vibrating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at the very least, you could have. Give me the party list or something, man. Yeah, you're, I was going to say, you're going to hurt John's feelings. You well, told I, well, these I, cool it, kids group you were belonging sorry, to. Sorry, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't mine to give. It was somebody else's <laughs> little group. Yeah. But, you know, like the, those, but they did get us, you know, into all the parties we wanted to. So everything was good. Um, but like, th- that's really where this, this goes is we just leave SMS behind. iMessage could detach from SMS and, and really just enhance iMessage to the point where SMS still worked, but it like, it felt very feature constrained. So what do you think about Apple engineers? Are they going to mess with iMessage anymore? Or are they going to leave it to these I, other I think other it's going to stay pretty simple. Yeah. I think, I mean, they've added like things like Animoji, right? There's right, apps, right. there's Apple pay cash now. Yeah. So I think that's where it goes. And, and they've added some things like, you know, per message, red receipts and that kind of sure. stuff. I mean, it's evolved, but Apple evolves this stuff slowly. But not bigly, like, uh, oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Pete. <laughs> like, uh, like WhatsApp, like Facebook Messenger hasn't, hasn't gained those major features that the, Correct. Uh, yeah. Correct. Like, um, like the messenger bots. Yeah. I saw a ton of those at CES. Um, I think I can talk about, well, I'm yeah, going to talk what, about it anyway. What, what, what are they? I, yeah. I saw, um, well, a messenger bot is a thing where you can like fake Facebook message with a device. So uh, I, okay. I think it was I think I'm allowed to talk about this. I think it was TiVo that had a messenger bot mm-hmm. for like they've got they demoed Alexa. Sorry, a word and G word control of of TiVo, which is really cool because you could say like a word, uh, you know, record uh, you know, any movies with Chevy Chase or whatever. And it yeah. just like, it, it oh. knows, right? And that's cool. You can also do it with a Facebook messenger bot because let's, let's accept, and we're gonna, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you know, voice assistants really aren't voice assistants. They are text. They are speech to text engines. Yes. And uh-huh. you have to know the exact syntax to get the end, the, the resulting engine to then parse and process your command. So it's not oh, understanding you? you. Well, you, yes, you do. Right. I mean, that's just well, how it works today. Well, but, the evolution I'll, will be that it won't. Yeah, correct. I'll argue in the negative. Yeah. Uh, Which reminds surely, me, there's but, actually a anyways. pretty, pretty fun, uh, funny uh, uh, Saturday Night Live skit on using uh, Odessa. Or okay, an, okay. or answers to any name that even resembles. Yes, the I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that's that's worth looking up on YouTube for a chuckle. Yeah. Um. So, it, but 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 like you know, so you can with the Facebook Messenger. But I want to come back to what you said, John, because I think that would be a good conversation. But the, to complete the thought on the Facebook Messenger bot, that takes the speech to text out of it, and you're just typing to the engine. And then the engine talks to whatever you want. And so that's what these messenger bots are. And they're they're great. I, I saw them actually had several people demo those to me, uh, because if you've done, you know, any sort of voice assistant control, you already have the the back end to, to deal with a messenger bot because it's literally just text, which is all you're getting from the voice control assistants anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. So, uh, it, it, you know, that. Could work really well. And then Facebook has done that. You know, could Apple do that? Yes. Have they? No, not in that sense. Right. Um, so it, it's it's interesting. And then, but and then some are better than others. And I, I don't and sorry if I'm going down too much of a rabbit hole. But have you noticed it, it, it's my anecdotal observation that Siri is far more responsive and accurate on my watch than ever on my telephone? Huh. That's interesting. I mean, I, I yeah. forget what I was asking for recently on my phone, and it was trying to find me restaurants in Turkey. And I'm like, mm. no. <laughs> That's bad. But no. Yeah. But but my watch almost never misses. So. Huh. Cool. You haven't noticed that? No. Okay. I, no, I find right. it uh, equally. It's, it's equally frustrating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. No. You know I what? Mean, no, it's good. When it's good, it's great. And there are times when you just want to, you know, go, oh, well, thank goodness my belt and shoelaces have been taken away from me because the frustration level is, is rising here. So let's have this conversation uh, in a minute. I want to, I want to talk about our, our sponsors first. And then, and then I want to talk about voice assistance because that was a big thing at CES and it sounds like we're going to talk about it anyway. So we might as well kind of put it in that conversation. But the first thing I want to talk about is our first sponsor, which is a new sponsor. And that is RoboForm at RoboForm.com. It's a password manager. And uh, I, I think everybody listening understands the benefit of using some kind of password manager because that is the only way to have different passwords for every site and every uh, you know place that you visit uh, without driving yourself crazy. Uh, otherwise, you're going to wind up using a password that's you know similar uh, or the same, and and then that's really really bad. So RoboForm password manager it works on iOS. It works on your Mac. It works on Windows. It works on Android. It works on Chrome OS. It works on Linux and has support for all uh, major browsers. You know, on my Mac, it immediately offered to install on Safari and Firefox and Google Chrome. Uh, it says it also supports Microsoft Edge, of course, not on the Mac because that's not on the Mac. Uh, very, very cool stuff. Works really well. I was able to import my logins from other password managers, work, which worked like swimmingly well. I, it was so simple. I thought it didn't work at first and then realized, no, it does. Uh, it's got some cool features. I started digging into it in the advanced settings. It has something called domains equivalents where you can say, hey, like if you're logging into, say, you know, if we go back in time, MacObserver.com and also iPodObserver.com, when we ran them as two separate sites, uh, you would have to have two separate passwords, even though they're literally the same back end in the same engine. Well, you can set domains equivalents and say, no, any password for, for one is a password for the other. And I know we've all seen websites like that. In fact, I saw it while we were in Vegas. There's like the, the MGM owns like half the hotels in Vegas, including the one we stayed at, the Mirage. But if you went to log in to your you know, rewards account at a different hotel, you had to go and look that up where it's like, nope, just set domains equivalents and you're good to go. So I really impressed with the way RoboForm works. I've been using it for a few days here. And uh, and here's the cool part. They have uh, you can use it for free on one uh, device. But if you want to sync and it will sync, you can use RoboForm Everywhere, which is the paid premium version of the software. $19.95 for one entire year for an individual user. So all of your devices or uh, $39.95 for a family of up to five users. Again, on everyone's devices, everybody gets their own syncing and all of that. And 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 when you sign up. And use promo code MGG, you save 10 bucks off of your RoboForm Everywhere subscription. So that can make it pretty inexpensive. And you do get a trial of it, too. So check it out. Visit RoboForm.com today and, uh, and check it out with coupon code MGG so that you can save yourself that 10 bucks. Pretty, pretty cool. Thanks to RoboForm for sponsoring this episode. I also want to uh, thank Bare Bones for sponsoring this episode with their uh, text editor, BB Edit. Truly one of my favorite apps. Uh, it's running on my Mac now. Uh, it's always running on my Mac. And when it's not running, something feels wrong. It's just how that works for me. I know it sounds crazy to be happy about a text editor, but it's true. I use it all the time. I wind up. Uh, using it to count words, I wind up using it to sort things, constantly sorting things. If I just grab some text in a web browser or whatever, if I, especially in an email, because mail doesn't sort anything, just grab it, copy it, paste it into BB Edit, choose sort, boom, copy it back, done. And now I've got things sorted. I know I'm not messing around. Everything's good to go. You can also do com document comparisons where you've got... Uh, the text of, say, an old version of a document and a new one right there. 
It shows you line by line, character by character, the differences in this beautiful three pane view where you can really navigate around. You can make edits on either side of the three pane view or both if you want. Right. Like one pane shows you a list of the, the changes and then the other two panes are much bigger and show you your actual two documents side by side. You can make changes on either one and save those. And obviously, then you're good to go. Uh, one of the other things I really like about BB Edit is it's got a command line tool. So instead of being at the terminal and having to remember how to use VI or Emacs or Nano or whatever, uh, I just type BB Edit space, the name of the file I want to edit. And what happens? It opens in BB Edit. I get to use my mouse and, you know, my everything the way I like to use it. And then I hit save and boom, the file saved. So you got to check it out. Go to barebones.com. Check out BB Edit. They too have a, it's not just a free trial. It's a, a free version of BB Edit that has most of the features I just discussed. So you may not ever need to upgrade that. Check it out. Our thanks to Barebones Software at barebones.com. All right, John. Let's talk about these yeah. voice. Let's talk about these voice assistants and and what we saw at CES. So and but but let's start with we'll go right down the rat hole here. Um, or the rabbit hole, I guess, is is a little more fun. I like rats. Okay, I good. rats. Yeah. Uh, you said that you don't think voice assistants are simple, simply speech to text engine engines, right? That's what I posited before, uh, and and you disagreed. Yes, Dave. You because as I as I pointed <laughs> out to you, no, as I pointed out to you in the past, the, the, their behavior. They're not simple translation engines, because as I pointed out to you, I think in the last podcast, and maybe you're setting me up for this, but my assistant responded differently. In a, uh, something that worked in the past didn't work at another time. And I'm like, why is this? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, well, whether or not I do is sort of irrelevant. Very specifically. So the thing is, so... My A word downstairs, I say A word lights off, A word lights on. And it always worked. These are link, uh, somewhat sure. dated technology and the, with the hub, but it has a um, uh, action, is a, what do you sure. call it? Or, or recipe, whatever. A skill. Um, yeah, a skill. So it has a skill in that ecosphere. And the thing is, I would expect it to work the same way. And that if I say the same thing to it, the same thing happens, but that doesn't happen. So- What's happening there, I think, is it's trying to apply intelligence, but it's doing it poorly because it didn't do what I wanted. So that's just my one data point uh, to throw in the conversation here is sometimes yeah. they're too smart for their own good and that it thought it was doing the right thing. And maybe it was loading a different context or thought I was somewhere else in the house or something, but it didn't do what I wanted. So and the thing is, we all want our assistants to do what we want. Not, you know, no what matter. we say, but what we want. Yeah, I, I would actually argue that you're you're proving my point for me. But great. It, it, I mean, continue. Well, just because that's exactly what I'm saying about these things is they aren't able to interpret what you want all the time. Like a human in the room hearing you say this, even if they are, uh, you know, for the first time hearing this instruction, if you said, you know, Dave, turn on the lights. I would know to turn on the lights in the room that I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Or you, you, you could get persnickety. Was, you would know what he wanted. Right. Yeah. Right. Or you could get persnickety like my assistant didn't say, turn on your own lights. I'm not going to do what you want. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is what it basically relayed yeah. to me. It's yeah. like, I'm not going to do what you asked me to. And it's like, why not? You did before. Well, because it's st uh, still a garbage in, garbage out interface. That's it's the thing. It's, it's, not, it's not intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. Yet. Yet, right. And so it's just, it really is just, and I, and I say this with a huge asterisk, just speech to text translation. That's really not as easy as I make it sound because doing that far field with other background noise, constantly having to ferret out who's talking, what direction, what's happening. I mean, like there is a lot of intelligence there. It's just not enough yet. Yeah. It, well, let's it assume is, it is enough. It is astounding technology. Well, let's assume, a microphone let's assume that the technology that can do that is perfect. Then you have the layer below it or above it right or to the side. Right. I don't know, which is how do you do something smart based on what I said? Right. You well, know, and when John says lights on and lights off, it's pretty clear in my mind what it means, especially if you have something called lights in your database of devices. So yeah. I don't know why it fails. Yep. 
Well, because the, the way it's built is you have to say a word, tell lights to turn on. A word, tell lights, turn off, right? right. John, but it's making me your words. bend to its, <laughs> but it's making me bend to its will. It's exactly Which, what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but, y- you know, so at CES, we saw quite a few. That, Dave. Uh, we saw quite a few things um, that, I mean, everything, mm-hmm. frankly, was adding voice control. Either it, some companies were adding their own voice control engines, but most were adding either, you know, a word or, or G words voice control because they're open platforms and they let people do this. And I, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's actually great what what some of these people are doing. They're they're really pushing the limits. And what was really cool is in each of the conversations that I had with companies that were doing this, it was obvious that both Amazon and Google were partnering with these folks, like at a very deep level to find out, like it would be the conversation would be like, well, hey, OK, say TiVo, right, wants to add voice control or is adding voice control. It's not quite yet certified by Amazon, but it will be. It'll be out, I think, end of next month. So like it's coming. Um, yeah, I think Dish already has. OK, yeah, because I have I've got one of the Alexa Sonos, uh, yep. Alexa Sonos one. We, we now say has a word. On oh, this show, yeah, Pete. I meant to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hey, hey, word. <laughs> uh, yeah. So but they're working really yeah. deeply with them and saying, hey, you know, what is it you want to do? And can we work together on this? And like the demo that TiVo did for me, as I said before, was very context aware. Once once you said a word, turn on living room TiVo. From that point, you could say a word change to CBS. And it knew the focus that you had. It's a different type of skill. And they've created these skills for companies like TiVo and Sonos, right? Mm-hmm. Where once sure. the once the the Amazon device has focus, you don't need to be pedantic about it, and you can say, yeah. you know, pause, rewind, skip, and it's yeah. just like doing these things, which right. is well, you shift in a new vocabulary, potential vocabulary. That, yeah, it's a subset, right? but is, also right. interesting. Uh, but I'll use the Sonos example that uh, if I if I group my speakers. It, it it can handle the groups, but if I don't group it and I tell yes, he group them, it goes stupid. It it's doesn't. Like, well, really? that, Come that on, they're be, right there. <laughs> that will be coming. Yeah, I'm told. No, but I I, I can understand. This is astounding technology. Right. Anyway, for for a microphone to translate a, 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 a audio impulse into machine language and turn it to ones and zeros and send a command to turn on a light, turn on a television, yeah, change the channel, record something. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, Pete, but, it still makes me feel bad, but I got to share this story is that one day I set a timer with Alexa. So Alexa is in my uh, please entertainment Please say center. a word, John. Yeah, yeah John. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try or to remember. <laughs> so anyways, um, but uh, uh, so my entertainment center has a unit and then my kitchen is where I cook my food and, and they were apart. And the thing is the alarm went off. So the A word set off the alarm and I was in the kitchen and I was so aggravated with hearing the boo, 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 that I screamed, A, A word, shut up. And she did. And yeah, then I felt course. terrible <laughs> because she heard me. Of course. I had to yell because the Farfield microphone picked it up from like two rooms away. But then I felt terrible because I, I, I was yelling at my assistant. It's like, what kind of good person does this sort of thing? Yeah. But she honored my request. A good assistant does what terrible. she's told. What yeah. she's told. That's kind of the nice part is it's an emotionless assistant. So yeah. you really don't have to feel bad about saying shut up to it. You, you know, it, 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 like really. She like, could have said you talking to me. Well, <laughs> but she that would have been more they, they aren't yes, quite replicants yet. So at CES, though, it, you know, one thing was missing from, I would say, 98 percent of all the conversations that I had about voice control. And it was HomeKit. Uh, and, and I don't mean to say that people said we aren't including HomeKit. I mean that HomeKit was not part of the conversation at all. Really? Like, no, no one even brought it up, despite the fact that it's obvious that I'm, you know, clearly talking to an audience of Mac and Apple. My experience sure. was varied in that I had more than one, especially when they saw Mac Observer. They were like, oh, by the way, we support HomeKit. So I, I saw... That's good. It it wasn't the trend, but it was it caught my attention and that more than one 
person that I spoke to with a Mac specific product did try to tout that they're, and the thing is they've lessened the requirements. I think with HomeKit before you had to get like this embedded chip and I had to talk to an Apple to that. They've changed the, the, they've loosened up the rules for you to be, become part of the club. It, it can so be done it's with easier software for people to do. now. Well, it, well, I think it, it could, used to have to include hardware or they strongly encouraged you to put a security chip and, and people are like, dude, are you nuts? Yeah, well, the security requirements are really are, are CPU dependent or CPU uh, hungry. And and that's where having a dedicated chip was was the right. thing. They've, but they've, more than one person said, you know, when we talked, it's like, yeah, how's dealing with Apple? And they're like, you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah I know. Well, that's the problem, right? <laughs> Anybody, any one of us could go right now and write our own skill for for Amazon for a word or or Google G word and right. start using it without ever needing to have a one on one conversation with someone and get it certified like like you don't have to do that you do with hardware devices uh, if they're going to listen but otherwise no you can just go like put a skill up. And and test it out. And HomeKit's not that way. And, uh, you know, it, I, Apple's behind the eight ball on this. And the reason I'm telling everybody here this is that I don't think it's worth waiting for uh, HomeKit to catch up because, frankly, I don't think it ever will. Um, there's so many devices out there that will never support HomeKit. Uh, that will always support, you know, Amazon or Google's offerings. And it, it an Apple centric household that has like an Echo Dot in it works very, very well. And I can say that from personal experience. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think we all can. Right. I mean, none of us are using HomeKit at, at all. Uh, I, actually, I am. I, I, I can't I'm, see I'm any of my devices for, with hey, currently. OK. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm right. using it for the Hue light, and okay. and I have the Apple TV fourth gen 4K that you know sure. has HomeKit that kind of it's your right, it has to be there to hub everything. Yeah, yeah sure. Yep. But uh, but that's all I'm using it for. But the yep. question that 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 I have is is why is Apple out of it? Is it because they're worried about security? Is it you know? And is that because you know the security of the Internet of Things? It doesn't seem like that big of a deal right now, but it can quickly be a problem, right? But it will. But HomeKit doesn't change that. Okay. Well, that's what I'm asking. Is Apple behind because of security, or are they behind behind because they're just more stringent for? I, I think it's the latter. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What you just said. Yeah. They made it too difficult to become part of the club yeah. or part that, of their. That's uh, what vendors yeah. would say when I asked them. It's yeah. like, wow. Oh, same. Yeah. Like I told you, yeah. I, I was like, yeah, dealing with Apple and eye roll, and it's like, right. yep, I hear you. Right. Right. <laughs> totally. Yeah. But they if, made it too if hard. They're a standards group for voice interface. Yeah, there's there's several yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> and like we it said, Dave, in the standards. past, standards are awesome because there are so many of them you exactly. can comply with, right? Yeah. Um, HomePod was the other thing, you know, kind of related to this that came up quite a bit at CES. Uh, mostly, it was people asking me, "Have you? What do you know about HomePod?" Um, and, and you know, m the the more time that passes the more people sit and scratch their heads and say 350 bucks to walk into the, the door with, with a speaker that does this. It's like, what well, you can buy a Sonos one, which has great sound for one nine, one ninety nine. Yeah. Yeah. And on sale at Christmas time for one forty nine. No, so, uh, with, yeah, was the one. Yeah. For, oh on, no. The, no, the, 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 the a word one was one ninety nine still, but yeah. 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 But still, you know, like Those there's, are, and, and they, they sound fantastic. They do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, it wouldn't surprise me if when HomePod comes out, we see the price drop. I did hear about one person that has HomePod in their home and <gasps> the comments, the comments were that room tuning actually works. Uh, the, the auto room tuning, presumably because it's really only doing it for music, not for theater. Uh, theater requires a much more sort of directional focused approach, whereas music can you can you can sort of make some guesses and be OK. Uh, they said that part works. Uh, the sound of it is fine. The voice control uh, is serious. Awful is is what um, what 
what I've, what I've been told. And you know, it makes sense because if we compare S word to a word to G word, a word and G word are, were built out of the gate to be voice interactions end to end, right? There is no screen. So everything happens. Now you might not get the information you want, but it, when you get to the end of the interaction, it always ends with voice. I, I think anybody that that's, has access to S word, uh, which most of us do on our Apple devices, finds ourselves. I, I would say half the time, if I'm asking questions of it, I am basically told, OK, now you need to look at your screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll continue on. I'll put it on your phone. I'll for put it. it on the screen for you. It's like, well, screw you. I'm driving. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, that's not OK. Yeah. It, you know, and so I, like that was the issue and, and I think is Apple's issue with HomePod getting like closing all of those doors because HomePod doesn't have a screen on it, at least not one that's going to function in that way right. based on what we saw and based on what I've been told. So it, like they have to not say, by the way, oh, sure. You want the results of that search? I've brought up a Bing search for you. Yeah. Where? Right. <laughs> Not on the home pod. Well, that's, that's for me to know and you to find out. Right. Be nicer to me and I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't get so snarky. Yeah. Quit yelling at me, John. <laughs> yeah. So this is it, it's going to be interesting. No, you, you. <laughs> no I said well, you yelled at day word yeah. the other day. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's that's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. And it may home pod may force Apple to make S word better. Uh, because it it closes this loop and makes it makes them have to live in a voice only system, right? Um, and so, I don't I don't know how they work there, but they they've got to be sitting in in rooms or groups or or areas over there that are just have got to be doing wild ideas on this. Oh you sure, know, how are of we? Of course, gonna, they're you know, smart yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I but I I don't think HomePod's going to be a home run. No pun intended. Out of the gate. I, no voice interface, no smart speaker has been it. When you get the, these things are Wi-Fi, they are far field voice and you need to have a million homes as test cases. Yeah. In order to learn what's wrong with your device. That's true. So, yeah, you got to You got to be got to give the moron test. You, you call, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, that's OK. But, yeah. I, you know, I've but, I've but, watched Sonos do this. I've watched other companies do it. And I mean, I've watched Amazon do it and sure. like they didn't get it right out of the gate until they just stuffed all these things in people's homes and was like, OK, great. Now, you know, race, race, race. Let's iterate and let's make it better. So I don't know. But, but you know, Apple's problem is they they have this reputation mostly in their own minds. Don't put out beta. Don't put out beta. And I don't see how that's possible but, with <sighs> multi-room audio or Far field voice. Yeah. And they're doing it all in one product for the first time. Tough. Yeah. It's a tough oh, yeah. place. Oh, yep. Yeah. yep. All I'll say is if you have access to this treasure trove of audio data from homes far and wide, you should do something with that. Well, they do. I mean, Amazon does. Well, except making a, a I'm, I'm, I'm thinking world domination. I mean, oh, oh, who well, cares about making a voice assistant that actually does what you want? <laughs> I would take all that data and aggregate well, it and. There's uh, that. Sorry. Uh, world domination. Right. Uh. Let's, let's go, let's go back and, uh, and <laughs> really? find, well, we started this show about messaging. Let's, let's continue there. Shall we? Well, there's we'll, light out of this bunny hole. Yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> go back to Terry here and, uh, and Terry asks, I've looked everywhere in mail.app and can't find a place to turn on red receipts. Is there a terminal command or is this just not possible in Apple Mail? Yes. The simple answer is it's not possible with Apple Mail in default mode. Correct. Um, it, it, but the good news and the reason I continue to use mail, despite there being other cl mail clients out there, is that on your Mac, mail is extensible, which means plugins can work. Mm -hmm. And there's a plugin called Mail Butler that will do red receipts. It actually does all kinds of great things. One of my favorite features that Mail Butler does is it will delay sending your messages. So when you you know you type a message, you hit send, you can set it to delay as long as you want. I have mine set to 60 seconds. 
so many times I've hit send and thought, you know, I want that back. Let me rephrase yeah. that. Let me. Oh, I. Oh, and it'll also if you if you say the word attachment in an email, but there's nothing attached even before it puts it in the 60 second queue. It'll be like, hey, uh, you didn't uh, you said attachment, but you didn't attach something. Are you sure you wanted to do? It's a nice catch. So mail Butler is probably going to be your friend. But, John, do you know about something else that we'll do um, that we'll do? Uh, red Yes, mail? sir. Cool. And I just pasted it in our notes here. So there's. Oh, no. Wait, what, what's going on here? Hold on. Insert link. Then we Tell us what that. it is. We can get the link in the notes later. Yeah. There we go. Well, okay. the thing is, it, it it's hidden, Dave. OK. So anyways, um. Basically, what you can do is through the terminal. You can. There is a header that you can set in your email called Disposition Notification 2. And if you set that on an outgoing email and the incoming server decides to honor that, it will ask you. And I've had this work, Dave. It only seems to work. So the thing is, there's a standard for asking for a reply. The problem is, Nearly every email client that I've seen ignores it. The only one that doesn't, Dave, is Outlook. Right. Because I have this set on one of my computers. So I say, all right, disposition notification two, and I have it set to my .Mac address. Only people that are running Outlook can see this because Outlook, for some bizarre reason, honors this heading and will ask the person, hey, did you read this? And they're like, yeah, sure. But it's only Outlook. So I, I just want to offer that is that the standard, the email standards did embrace this concept, but they all ignore it. Yeah. So as you said, either um, Mail Butler ha has the feature. I know I've seen that. Or things like MailChimp and others. And I think what they do, they all use what we call a web bug. A hidden, right? a hidden one pixel. It's image. a hidden one by one graphic that basically if you open an email Wherever that graphic is hosted says, hey, somebody access me. And that leads to, well, somebody probably at least read me, not necessarily understood or comprehended what I said, but at least open the email. Right. And that, that's how they pull that off. So it's it's sneaky because why not just to use the standard? But I don't know. Well, because the, because nobody supports the standard. Right. <laughs> the, the, the nice part about and I use nice in quotes uh, about uh, the one by one tracking image is it sort of is the end around for mm -hmm. clients trying not to be tracked, but it's also why your junk mail won't load images without you telling it to, it won't load them automatically right? because it figures those are trackers that will confirm that this is a valid address. Yep. And then you'll get piles more spam. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's your way of saying, yes, please send me more. Can but I I've seen many another? services. If you search, Dave, so, uh, you know, we, we love um, MailChimp because they have a feature if you use them for mass mailing. But there are several others when I search, you know, email, read, receipt. There are a lot of services, some I've never heard of, so I'm not going to use them. But, you know, some of the bigger, uh, you know, people that allow you to do email campaigns will give you this ability. Sure. So that, that's another option if, if you don't want to roll your own with something. Uh, like you mentioned, um, yeah. What was it? Uh, Mail Butler. So, do they set up a, a local server? Or what? No, they, they have their own server that that does. Okay, the all right. So they put, they put the yeah. they so they put the tracking graphics on their server. Oh, correct. Nice. Correct. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you know, it's a they they. There's some level of it that you can do for free, and then beyond that, you pay. You know, depending on how much you need to do per month or whatever. Right. So, yeah. Now that you got to think good. about this though. Do you really want to obsess over how many people open your? Yeah, maybe well, you cer no. certain emails. <laughs> yes, and it helps with like a, a mailing list to know if people are opening it uh, for a lot of reasons. So, well, for know. us, like you know, when we want to know if you like a, a, a goodie from us, uh, right. we'd certainly like to know if you received the email. Yeah, exactly. We like to. It's yeah. important to us. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I used to use one called Mail Acton, and at some point that went away apparently because uh, from off of my laptop, and oh. I just tried to go back to their website and it says site not found. No, uh, no, no. So Mail Acton still indev, very much exists. Indev.ca. Well, so Indev okay. and 
Oh, it was and and little known software. So Scott Morrison, who ran indev.ca okay. and Scott Little, who ran little known software, both made mail plugins and they merged to a company called Small Cubed. OK. And Mail Acton is very much still. Oh, good. Developed. OK, because I remember, boy, you know, I was sitting there as soon as I saw that question, I went, yeah, I used to do that all the time. Yeah. And, and it would let you uh, pull mail back for about a minute, you know, until the connection with the other server closed and that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, I don't know. I don't remember. I use Mail Act on every day, and I yeah. don't. I don't know that it has that feature, but it may. Yeah. Maybe I just yeah. don't use it. Yeah, and it's Dave, just, okay. Dave. I'm looking on the MacWorld website. It talks about having a Mavericks version, so so it's at least fairly up to date. Um, you yeah. know, Mavericks not too far back. Okay. Um, I thought Hazel at one point supported this, but maybe not. I mean, Hazel does like a, a gajillion things, and maybe that was one that I misremembered. Remembered. She's, she's powerful. She is. Yeah. I don't uh, think Hazel will do mail though. So um, mail act on will do delays on the send, yeah. but it won't do the red receipts. No. Huh. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. But it did some cool filing. I remember that, well, that because when I was the uh, safety it, chairman at work, it was, you know, I had so much email and it, it allows you to so, trigger rules with yes. keystrokes. Yes. Which is great. For, like you said, for filing, because you can do lots of different things in a rule, and when you, you've got a message highlighted, you just say, you know, like if for, for me, for press releases, I want to mark it as unread. I want to like do a couple things and then file it into our, you know, general press release sure. folder. So I hit control R and all of the things that I need to happen, happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's good. So there's, there's, a really there's some really cool extensions out there yeah. for mail is the that, point. You that's can do why more like than a red receipt. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you say red receipt and not read receipt. Yeah, because it's so red. Past tense. Past tense. Red. Okay. Yeah. The message has that. been red. Yeah. What's red and white and black all over or something like that? <laughs> it's a newspaper. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not even going to. I, I got some. I got some Skunk knee with a diaper that, rash. But. Oh, yeah. All right. Shh. <laughs> uh, you know, I've got, there's all kinds of things we're going to talk about here, but uh, last week I didn't have all this data with me on my laptop in the hotel in Vegas. So I want to make sure that we go through this all and get it here now before the end of the show. And that is, I want to thank our, all of our premium subscribers that have contributed for the last two weeks because you all rock. And you can find out about this at macgeekab.com slash premium. On our $25 a month, uh, sorry, $25 biannual plan twice a year is Graham R., Robert T., Mark S., Zach E., Bruce M., Gary T., Paul W., Avram M., James M., Richard J., Kurt W., Walter H., Eddie M., Greg H., Anthony N., Deborah L., Bob L., and Ron G. Thanks to all of you at the $25 every six month plan. Also, Dennis J at $30 every six months on the monthly plan. We have to thank Michael P, Bob L, Ari L, J C, Paul M, Scott F, Neil L, Mark R, Joe S, James C, John G, James B, Barry F, Frank A, and Abdullah B. And a one-time donation of a hundred bucks also from Karsten. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, and I say it every week. It really, it makes a huge difference in us being able to do what we do. Things like CES and, you know, really just everything that we do. Uh, your support means a ton. So thank you very much. And with that, it's time to answer some questions from a few premium listeners. Louie is on deck and, uh, and Louie asks, Something that's probably going to be controversial. I ah. recently moved to High Sierra on my laptop and my iMac. I started from scratch, from fresh, like really fresh. I got all my hard drives reformatted in APFS file format on both my machines. Some of my backup drives using Carbon Copy Cloner are now getting Drive Genius consistency issues. When I run the Drive Genius repair, I get an error that says, uh, Mount APFS exit status three safe backup could not be repaired. And on the consistency check, an issue was detected with this volume. Uh, should I worry? I tried some Google foo, but with very limited success, I'm running the latest drive genius. Of course. What do you think? 
So there's two things here. Number one, this is the very first version of Drive Genius that supports APFS. So mm -hmm. it is possible that you are running into a corner case with Drive Genius that's not that's reporting an error that isn't there. I would I would run disk first aid on these to see what that says. That said, I also wouldn't run APFS on rotational drives right now, given everything that we've seen. Uh, I know wait, it's like we want to. I like the idea of partitioning and all of that stuff. But we have to remember, Apple isn't supporting it on a on on uh, rotational drives. They are. Oh, 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 no, they're not. You say that, but continue. We, well, I, I say that because if you have High Sierra installed on an SSD and you install, or if you if you have Sierra installed on an SSD, it will auto convert the drive to APFS when you upgrade yes. to High Sierra. If you mm -hmm. have Sierra installed on a rotational drive, mm -hmm. it will leave it as HFS plus uh, when you upgrade to high Sierra. OK, so it, it's it's Apple is not supporting this there. They are not recommending it. And uh, and, uh, and to I, be I, fair, I, I, I disagree. But well, to be fair, a, continue. APFS was not built to be used on an on a non SSD. It was in fact, it was built specifically to be used on SSDs. Uh, and it takes advantage of a lot of the um, uh, features uh, okay. of an SSD. So all go right, ahead, continue. John. No, I'm, uh, I'm, all right. I'm, there you I'm, go. I'm, yeah. Okay. I'm, 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 I will counter your statement with um, information from Apple. Okay. Uh, specifically, an article called "Frequently Asked Questions About Compatibility About Apple File System." So it's an article I will show you. I think it's uh, no, it's in their developer database. So okay. maybe it's old data, but it says, can I use Apple file system with my existing hard drive? Yes. Apple file system is optimized for flash slash SSD storage, but can also be used with traditional hard drives and external direct attached storage. So that is a statement that you're making in a document on their developer website. So. Sure. I'm just going to throw that out there. The reason I say this, Dave, is that I made the crazy decision today to reformat both my backup drives that are rotational that I use for carbon copy cloner as APFS. Okay. And we'll see what happens. It yeah, could well, end oh, it's in good to, tears. It's good to see what happens. I, I, I don't <laughs> disagree. I, I just wouldn't recommend it to anybody. The That's thing is, different. Uh, I ran I into say. situations with both of my rotational backup drives where I'm like, you know what? It's about time to reformat them. Either they got full or I'm using uh, uh, iCloud photo library or increased my uh, uh, iCloud storage, which I did both, by the way. Oh, sweet. We'll yeah. talk about that later. Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> but all of a sudden it resulted in my taking up lots more space on my drives. Right. And one of my drives actually filled up on Carbon Copy Cloner because it was taking up a couple of hundred more gigabytes because, you know. So I decided to uh, reformat them as APFS encrypted. And, well, we'll see. I mean, so I, you, I was able you to do a full backup. You did a, a complete, re like, wipe and reformat. You Correct. didn't use disk utility to convert them from Oh, no, HFS. I did. No, I, I did not do a convert. I did a okay. erase APFS encrypted. Because you can use disk utility to do it, uh, yes, and without losing data, non destructively. Presu I mean, I'd still. Well, have backup, I chose but. to do it destructively. Sure. Yeah. So. Of course. Of course. Yeah, I'm curious to see how it works out. I mean, I, I think you know, two years from now, APFS will be mature enough to be reliable on, mm. uh, you, you know, on all types of drives, and it just won't engage some of its features. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how it works now that there's certain features it won't engage if it's not on an SSD because SSDs are different. So, uh, but I like, based you got on everything the same page I've, that I got. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Based on everything that I've seen, I, I just wouldn't recommend it to a client to mm -hmm. a, you know, I mean, I would tell everybody, I don't recommend this. Now, if somebody says that's fine, but I, I want to take the risk. Great. No problem. In fact, I probably will do it, too. But it's this is mm -hmm. one of those let me test or let us test. And now you're testing. So maybe I don't have to. Uh, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't rely on it. I would definitely have. Even okay. If I was doing it myself, I would have clones of clones because. Oh, but I do. Good. So. Good. 
Yeah, they wouldn't yeah, be my both only Both those drives client. are backed up to at least one other destination. Good. So, Good. So yeah. this is my test for you, the listener. I'm, I'm making the leap here to see if APFS is a good thing to do on rotational drives. Yeah. And I'll let you know, if you don't hear from me for several weeks, then probably not. Yeah, that's right. Well, we, we hope to <laughs> keep hearing from you every week, regardless. In fact, you tell us about it. All right. Um, jumping around a little bit here. Listener Steve wrote in and asked, uh, he had a networking question and we love networking questions, especially the ones like Steve. He says, I'm considering adding slash using a uh, Synology RT 2600 AC as a router for my network and then using my existing two airport extremes as wired extensions in bridge mode. Can you tell me how this compares to a mesh network? And, and am I losing anything not going to true mesh? He says on the mesh side, I'm looking at things like Orbi, Linksys and the latest Eero. OK, so you're creating with with your RT 2600 AC or really any router a series of routers where you put one in router mode and then others in bridge mode. Uh, you're creating what I call a quasi mesh. OK, and and. What I mean by that is you have some of the uh, characteristics of a mesh, most notably access points spread throughout your location, all of which I would recommend you have the same SSID so that your devices can just sort of roam from one to the other and pick up whichever one they feel is the right one. And uh, and and that's basically and that's actually a lot. Like, I would say that's maybe 60, and, 65% of what benefits Mesh provides. But go ahead, John. Well, I think, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but do you want them on different channels? I would I would lean towards yes. I, I would. Some of the Mesh products don't put things on different channels, but in controlling it, yeah, I would put them on, on different channels so you don't Just have any Just that overlap. it makes... Yeah, for for the most part, I think the it makes the life of the client easier. It's like, do I choose this one with this name on this channel or this one with the same name on that channel? And I think for well, a lot of them, again, the it, it makes channels it easier. don't confuse the clients. It they they go by Mac. Address. Not confused, but may help them. Oh, okay. It, but but it will make your without having channel contention. Um, assuming you don't have any neighbors that are causing it, regardless. But if you if you get to control the environment. Without channel contention, you get more bandwidth on every channel because there's no sharing of. of right. Of, of so, so general practice yeah. is you should probably spread out if you have multiple access points, spread out the channel. Yes. Uh, yeah, totally. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, that but that's about where your but, but see, this is this is a perfect example of what you don't get by going to a real mesh doing a quasi mesh. You have to think about all these things with a real mesh. It manages everything for you from one interface. So instead, in, in the scenario you describe, you'd have to go to your Synology router to set the channels there and the SSID there. Then you'd have to know the IP address of each of your airport extreme base stations. Well, or you'd run airport utility, actually, <sighs> which, yeah, which is fine. And it'll find them. And then you have to go to each one and set them into bridge mode and set their channels and set their SSIDs and, you know, go through all of that. Whereas if you have one of these mesh solutions, you get one interface and everything happens there. Um, right. You also don't with a quasi mesh, you don't get what I call the common intelligence where every access point knows about the others with your, um, you know, your your hybrid approach, your quasi mesh approach. Your Synology doesn't know what's connected to your airport Wi-Fi and your airport Wi-Fi certainly doesn't know what's connected to your Synology. The Synology is going to route it all. But from a Wi-Fi standpoint, they are not sharing any relevant information. And that right. can, right, you know, and that can kind of make it. Uh, well, they know about each other, but. They don't know what clients are connected. But they, they don't do anything. They're not going to hand off. Remotely no. intelligent. It's just like, yeah, you're, you're, you're another yeah. channel. You're just another thing. And you've, you've created thing. a device. And it, honestly, they're all going to show up um, as Ethernet devices, right? So if you're uh, in this scenario where the Synology is the router and the airport is the the, the bridge, you know, the mesh point, if you will, if you have uh, your iPhone connected to the Synology, it's going to show up as a wireless device on the Synology. If you have your iPhone connected 
to the airport base station, it's going to show up as an Ethernet device on the Synology because that's right. how it's coming through. And that's the third thing. You can only do Ethernet backhaul if you're doing this quasi mesh. Now, I'm presuming by nature of you asking the question, that's not an issue. But if anything happens to your Ethernet or anything, you don't really have the option of doing Wi-Fi backhaul. And I put an asterisk on that. There's always the option of doing Wi-Fi backhaul. But it's it it's in this scenario, the one you're describing, it's a major headache to set it up. Whereas with a true mesh solution, Wi-Fi backhaul is sort of part of the game and you can just do it. In fact, some meshes don't even support Ethernet backhaul. But thankfully, the three that you mentioned, the Orbi, the Velop and the Eero all do now. Um, so I, there's nothing wrong with creating a quasi mesh. Again, it's one of those geek scenarios. Would I recommend this to my family members? Not anymore. I used to set it up for them because we had no other choice. But now that these other things exist, it's like, screw that. I just want one thing and you can manage it yourself. It's awesome. So it just yeah. works. It just basically yep. it just works. I still see, you know, it's still, even though they insist they don't do this, Dave, I still see with my Eero. Um, on my various machines running. Um, uh, what am I running here? I'm sorry. Hold on. It's okay. Uh, I'll get the point here. But anyways, I see my machines shifting from one to the other, and I, 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 I'm I, still convinced there are smarts somewhere, Dave. I, even I, though they I there aren't. totally agree with you. I with the arrow. And this. then all of a sudden I see it go from one, you know, it says like B-S-S-I-D, from here to here. And I'm like, well, why did you do that? I'm like, yep. somebody told you to do that. Yep. I don't think the Mac told you to their, do that. Their CEO has looked me in the eye across a video conference, but still, <laughs> and told me that they don't do this. Because I asked him, I'm like, so how are you, like, are you using 802.11 KVNR to do this? He's like, no, we're not employing it. Now, they have started employing 802.11R, which is the fast switching, which means a client at the client's choosing can switch from one access point to the other without renegotiating the security key, which makes it way faster and better for like VoIP calls. So that if you jump, if you're wandering around your house, as certainly I do when you're on the phone, uh, it, you know, if you jump to a different access point, you're not going to lose the call. Uh, that's the only thing they, they, th that they say they're doing, but I'm with you. I feel like there's a little bit more intelligence there, but yeah, wow. I'm sorry. It's a Dubuki tools. Okay. Yeah. So the bookie tools is like totally awesome if you're on a Mac. And it basically tells you when your machine is shifting from one access point to another. And I'll see this. It's like I'm going from here to here. Here's yeah. the SSID. Here's the, uh, you know, the channel width and all that. And I'm like, why'd you do that? Why, yeah. Why'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because somebody told me to. It's like, yep. who told you? So, who told yeah, I'm you? with you on that. But, yep. you know, works great. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, I think we got that covered. Um, where are we on time here? Yeah, da, 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 da. Eh, let's do Gary. I think, um, Gary wants to be done. Yeah, Gary does. <laughs> it's, I don't know if we're going to go where we want to go. Are we done with Gary? Um, or is Gary done I'm with talking us? about, um, upgrading your memory, your RAM on your iMac. Um, I've seen a couple of shows. One was nine to five where they added, Two eight gigs to the existing two four gigs, and he added them together or whatever. And uh, but I and I saw another sh show that did that. But I once saw a Larry Jordan radio show or heard a Larry Jordan radio show where an expert on memory was on there, and he said if you do that, if you have you know, two at four and two at eight, the system only recognizes four, the the lowest one. So you'd really only have 16. But I'd wonder if you could do a, an art, you know, do a, a segment on clarifying that because, uh, you know, a person would like to be able to, to do the four and eight. But, uh, and I think I've heard that another place too that, it only recognizes the smallest one. So, you know, you see a lot of people quote the nine to five guy, but I, I wonder if he's accurate on that or not. But thanks a lot. I appreciate all your help and all your, your content and work. My name is Gary. All right, Gary. Uh, yeah. So this is, it, it, it's a good question. Um, there are computers 
that require RAM to be installed in banks of say two or four. Um, and in, in that case, if it requires RAM to be installed in a bank of four and the first two are four, whatever gigabyte chips, and then the second two are eights, it's only going to see all of those as four gigabyte chips. Um, your Mac though, most of your Macs, and I'm, I say this without knowing which the Mac Pro does. I'm hoping, John, you'll you'll catch me on this or somebody will. Maybe somebody in the chat room. Uh, but most Macs are do not require RAM to be installed in pairs. Now, there can be a benefit to installing RAM in pairs because it can do memory interleaving. And you can get like a 10 to 15 percent speed improvement on your RAM when that happens. But... It is not mandatory on most Macs, and hopefully somebody's going to tell me whether I'm wrong. For it to interleave and stuff, it has to be the same clock speed. and it, all, Same size, know, same yeah, clock, yeah. same everything. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you get a benefit in that it ba basically, last I checked, it makes the data bus twice as big as it normally would be if they're the same mm. flavor of chip. Okay. So, hooray, you get you get increased through, throughput. But what, what was the uh, machine again? specifically the year he, he didn't say which machine he was just talking in in general so okay uh, my advice would be so the best source that i've seen dave for information about this the problem here folks is apple sometimes lies and that they will underestimate the amount of ram that a machine can handle my best source for finding about finding out about the truth is backtracker Okay. okay. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay. No, it basically tells you, okay, well, here's how much RAM your machine said it could take from Apple, and here's how much it can really take. <laughs> so they're the best source. And the thing is, um, I found their advice uh, uh, accurate so far. Uh, sometimes it gets weird. I, I haven't found it getting weird in that you have like mismatched like in the past they'd be like, oh, okay, well, if you have a four and a two gig, then you get six gigs in this machine. And it's like, why are you doing this? But for the most part, I think the, the most recent machines will take uh, their happiest when they get pairs, uh, paired um, RAM chips of the same capacity. For that, that, then, for that interleaving that we talked about. Yeah. And, and just in general, I think it, it makes sense. It, it doesn't make sense to, you know, get a two and a four. Why would you even do that? I don't know. Well, you, I mean, you would opinion. totally do that if you, let's say, had a computer that only had a two in it and you wanted to add some RAM and you add four. Like there's nothing yeah, if it's wrong older, with that. But yeah. yeah. Or you had yeah, a dead the, the, laptop that had some memory in it you wanted to use. Sure. Or, you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't, it, there's not, it, it's not like your computer is going to be, so suffer from a sense of malaise if it has mixed uh, sizes in it. It's either going to have matched pairs and take advantage of interleaving. Oh, sure. Or it's not. But I mean, it's not going to be upset with you if you put. Oh, no, I think I think in. it's just atypical in this day and age that you don't get. Yeah. What, a what's machine. being made right now anyway? Uh, the Mac Mini and uh, what about the MacBook? Are they user serviceable? No. Everything else is. Yeah, no. everything is. You it's, have to buy it that way or, or yeah. go to iFix it or something. And, the the and iMacs other than the iMac Pro, iMacs yeah. are upgradable. Okay. Uh, um. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Because like my MacBook Pro came with I don't know I put like sixteen or something in it, but that you know that's the old adage. Sure. You buy as much RAM as you can possibly afford up front. Totally. So you aren't fighting this mm -hmm. issue at a at a later point in time. Yeah. And, and most of them recently seem to me not to be user serviceable. Well, yeah. The so, again the IMAX are the yeah. the okay. even the twenty seventeen five K is is user serviceable nice. from RAM. It's just not the iMac Pro. Yeah. And okay. the Mac Pro is the same way. So you can you don't have to put match stuff in there. It's just if you do, you'll get advan you'll take advantage of interleaving. If not, then you won't. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So I get where you this, you know, whatever I think it was the Larry Jordan show that um that listener Gary was was talking about and that I mean there were computers and probably still are some servers that that require RAM and banks but generally no um, I remember that being a lot more of an issue back when I was the first a new switcher in totally. 07 and 08 and all yeah they were very adamant about well I remember my SE30 I mean now we're going back to you know yeah. 100 years to 1989 but uh that one had eight slots two banks of four 
and the four had to be matched. Yeah. And I got it, I got the machine with four ones, one megabyte yeah. chips. Ooh, yeah, four right? megabytes, brother. And then I added four fours Meg- to that. Megabytes. I think. Of RAM, man. Yeah. Yeah. I had more RAM than I would ever need in my life. And in that computer, that was true. But uh, yeah. not necessarily. Yeah. All I remember is there was one point in time, Dave, in our past when Apple was being a bunch of babies and the RAM that you put in the machine, they all of a sudden tightened the uh, uh, yeah restrictions on it or timings. Yeah. So all of a sudden RAM that used to work didn't and the I machine would start up and I'm like, dude, wait, this RAM worked. Why are you? Yeah. Yeah, don't, folks, hey, John's right, but we're also talking about uh, 18, 19, years. 17 years ago. No, it was more than that because it was I, it was with my Pismo PowerBook that I experienced this. Yeah. So that that was that was 17 years ago. It was, it's pre Mac Geek yeah. So just, you know, bear that in mind. It's not anything we've seen recently, but but he's right. The Apple yeah. tightened up their timing restrictions to be fair. And this was kind of one of those things. Uh yeah. OWC, Ramjet, and Memory to Go, and and uh, the last oh, yeah. two the last two companies don't they're here to party don't really exist. No, they had to they honored their their warranties and replaced everybody's RAM. Oh, I remember that they're like, yeah. okay, Apple's being jerks, but we'll yeah we're not right. <laughs> yeah, more power to them. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Uh, while I'm mentioning OWC, I did want to mention, you know, we talked about CES in this show. So uh, I did want to mention the fact that both uh, or not both, all three, uh, Elgato, Smile and OWC were there to help uh, support us at CES and and helped cover our, our expenses. They were our show sponsors for our coverage. And I, I wanted to throw out a thanks to them in this episode as well. Lastly, we got time for a few tips. So. I think we can do this. Christopher with a K says in episode 690, you mentioned a problem with responsive web design, whereby Allison Sheridan's father-in-law unintentionally triggered a website's responsive design features by using a narrow browser window. I've run into that another way that the responsive features can be invoked on a sufficiently wide browser window by using command plus to zoom in. Occasionally, my wife will forget that she has zoomed into a site using Command Plus in order to see some small detail. And if you didn't know that, that can be one of your five things. Command Plus, Command Minus. You can zoom in and out of web pages. It's really, really nice. Uh, Upon navigating to a responsive site, though, a sufficiently wide but still zoomed in browser window triggers responsive features, which makes sense. And Safari presents her with the mobile layout. It's not uncommon for me to suggest command zero, which is also the same as going view actual size as my first suggestion when she thinks a site looks odd. Many times that's all she needs. Thank you, Christopher. That's awesome. Uh, It wouldn't surprise me if that's part of what um, Allison's father was seeing, too. So very good stuff. Um, And also episode 690, we heard from Ed who said, uh, you said that NoteBurner is what you use to remove DRM from app, uh, from Apple's iTunes store videos on your Mac, but NoteBurner does not work with High Sierra, and they haven't mm. been able to get that fixed. I've tried using my wife's laptop running El Capitan in NoteBurner and attaching my external iTunes media drive with mixed results. I've also tried screen recording with QuickTime, but wasn't able to get that to work either. I'm trying to use my purchased iTunes movies with Plex, but can't get past this DRM problem. Now, you're, and he asked if I have any ideas, which sadly I don't. Uh, you're totally right. I When we talked about it uh, a couple of weeks ago, I realized, I didn't realize, I've realized since that I haven't used NoteBurner since I upgraded um, sort of the Mac that I do it with to High Sierra. And uh, and you're right. It doesn't work with High Sierra. So I don't know the answer. If somebody out there does feedback at MacGeekGab.com is what you would uh, what you would send that to us. And then we will share with the rest of the uh, folks out there. So are you sure about that, Dave? I I wasn't quite sure I heard you, but I thought I heard you say feedback at MacGeekGab. Oh, I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. That's That's what I heard. Feedback at MacGeekGab. Geekgab.com. Right. And, and I'm borrowing the headset, so, you know. It's, uh, it's you know, true. Yeah, I'm That's true. It. You look good with the borrowed headset. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, the last thing. We started this episode talking about messages, and we are going to finish it. Listener Dave says, um, talking about messages in episode 690 where 
things were out of order, he found a, uh, a an article that offers some suggestions for fixing these out of order iMessages. And I'll tell you, I have seen this on all of my devices at least once. I really do think it's related to iCloud um, and the message, the iMessage syncing that doesn't yet exist on any of our client devices. I, I think there's there's like I think, frankly, that High Sierra and iOS 11 were built with the assumption that we would be doing iCloud for the iMessage syncing. And now that we're not, I think there are some some edges and crumbs left over in the code that maybe don't sort things the way they're supposed to. So there are five, I think, suggestions in this article. We'll put a link to the article in the show notes, but we'll we'll read the suggestions just to kind of top level down. Number one is restart your phone or your Mac. I've definitely seen this work. Uh, number two is to force restart your phone. Uh, I'm not sure why they would say that at Gadget Hacks, but sure, why not? Uh, and there are different ways to force restart different iPhones that they've got in there. Uh, reboot the automatic date and time settings. So go into settings, general date and time and turn off and then on the set automatically option there so that it sort of forces itself to to resync its time zone that uh that people seem to think that might be part of it uh method five then oh i i lied because there's a sixth one but i don't like the sixth one uh method five says toggle iMessage on and off so again settings messages turn iMessage on or rather off wait 10 to 15 seconds turn it back on and then the last one is reset all settings but like i said i'm not into that because uh Nobody likes to have to reset all their settings, especially not me. So that's what I got for today, John. I don't know what you got, but um, I think that's where we're going to have to, uh, that's where we're going to have to wrap it up, my friend. I think. I think I have a big old bag of, we're done with this. Uh, yeah, I'll, sh- I'll share. Can I share your big old bag of, uh, uh, we're yeah, done Pete, with this? Do you want to share in the bag? Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Can we share in the bag, everybody in the chat room at macgeekgab.com slash stream? Can we do that? Yeah. Somebody just joined. Oh, you're late. <laughs> you're, you're, you're late. That's right. Uh, you got to buy that. If, le- if you're late, you have to buy the bag if we're done with this. That's right. Uh, for everybody else in the room. Uh, we already told you how to email us. If uh, you'd like to join our great Facebook group, visit macgeekgab.com slash Facebook. I want to show a, or want to send a big shout out of thanks to the folks at Cashfly who provide all the bandwidth to get the show oh, from yeah. us to you. I want to thank our sponsors. As I said earlier in the show, RoboForm, where coupon code MGG saves you 10 bucks off of RoboForm everywhere. That's at RoboForm.com. And also BB Edit from Barebones Software at Barebones.com. In the podcast marketplace, of course, Smile and OWC are there, as well as a new one coming in that we'll talk about uh, coming up in a new show. New episode, I should say. This same show, new episode. And uh, I want to thank all of you for listening. Again, a huge shout out to all of our premium subscribers. You rock. And uh, you, uh, you, you had some tips going earlier. I got one more for you guys. Okay. And gals. Okay. Do you pee? What is it, man? Whatever you do this week, don't get caught. Made up.